First, I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me. It is a great honor for me to be here. And thank you for the possibility to share with you some uh, current uh, results of our ongoing study, which combines haploidentical stem cell, tra stem cell transplantation and immunotherapy after transplantation. So the Tübingen concept for relapsed neuroblastoma patients consists of first a transplantation of haplo, that means half identical stem cells from the patients, father or mother of course, which includes a high dose chemotherapy, the so-called conditioning regimen, which has to wipe out the complete bone marrow of the patient and which establishes afterwards a new healthy donor-derived immune system from the father or from the mother. And second, we want to add a post-transplant immunotherapy afterwards on the basis of donor-derived natural killer cells and antibody infusions. So what is haploidentical stem cell transplantation? Here we use a donor who shares at least the half, that means one haplotype of his HLA antigens with the patient, and that is normally the mother or the father, or it does not work really, or sometimes an adult uh, sibling. So why do we want to use a haplodonor? Because these donors, the parents of course, are always motivated and available, and because natural killer cells represent an important component of, component of those grafts. They have first alloreactive effects in vitro and in vivo against neuroblastomas and other tumors. And second, after stem cell transplantation with such HLA mismatched haploidentical donors, such alloreactive effects of NK cells in patients have already been proven, however, in leukemia patients. So this is our own Tübingen model, which illustrates the NK cell mediated alloreactivity. This is proven for leukemia patients. What means alloreactivity? The natural killer cell is uh, ruled uh, uh, by, um, by several activating and inhibitory receptors on its surface, and some HLA alleles are already known cognate, cognate ligands for such inhibitory receptors. By example, this HLA-C family, HLA-C2456 and others inhibit this receptor and HLA-C1378, this called CD1 group, uh, inhibits this receptor. In our patients who had a haploidentical transplantation, uh, in case of leukemia, of course, these patients mainly expressed this inhibitory receptor here. And indeed, patients who had no ligand for this inhibitory receptor had a significant better survival than patients who had this ligand present and therefore probably uh, inhibited the new donor-derived NK cells. Apart from that, allor such alloreactive effects in neuroblastoma are still unclear. However, most neuroblastoma cell lines are per se valid targets for NK cells because many of them have a so-called reduced HLA class 1 expression. And after haplotransplantation, or haplotransplantation allows to co-transfuse high amounts of NK cells at day zero from the donor and provides a fast NK cell recovery afterwards. And this is just to illustrate you that several neuroblastoma cell lines can be killed very effectively by NK cells. These three cell lines can be lysed by NK cells, this cell line not is uh, not really susceptible of most cell lines and I think most neuroblastomas are susceptible to NK cell lysis. And here you can see the results of uh, 
patients who receive such a haplotransplantation in several uh, centers all over Germany. We identified 25 patients who received a haplotransplant in the last years and the event-free survival was 26%. All these patients had a relapsed neuroblastoma and all these patients had a previous autologous transplantation before. So all patients had an engraftment. Fortunately, no transplant-related mortality occurred in these patients. However, relapse or progression occurred in a high percentage of these patients. So the conclusion is even haplotransplantation itself seems not to be sufficient for the majority of patients. But it may be the basis for a further immunotherapy with the donor-derived immune system, not with the patient immune system, but with the donor-derived immune system and additional effector cells or antibodies. So one option for immunotherapy, and you have heard that now for several times, is to increase the NK cell activity with the help of ADCC. Normally the NK cell can be inhibited via its inhibitory receptors if the tumor cell expresses cognate HLA ligands. However, if it's possible to stain the tumor cell with a specific antibody, and that is of course an antibody against the GD2 antigen, the NK cell can bind via its FC receptor to this antibody and a killing will occur. <coughs> and this is in vitro ADCC against neuroblastoma cell lines with NK cells from patients after transplantation at a very early time point day 14 and day 21 after transplantation, without antibody, no sufficient lysis, with uh, humanized 1418 antibody, much better lysis, and best results were obtained with a combination of interleukin-2 stimulation of the NK cells and use of a uh, uh, specific antibody. So that's that is why we started a phase two feasibility study within the uh, or under the umbrella of the Siopen Airnet using the very well known CH 1418 antibody and subcutaneous interleukin 2 after haplo identical stem centration only in patients with relapsed neuroblastoma. And this is the overview. We first recommend to do another MIBG therapy, then there will be a break of at least two weeks. Then we do the haplotransplantation and we co-infuse high numbers of natural killer cells from the donor at day zero. Earliest on day 60 after transplantation, we can start with the anti-GD2 infusions and we, we use in this approach the standard uh, infusion scheme, an uh, eight hour infusion, 20 milligram per square meters for five days. We want to give uh, six, at least six cycles, and we start at cycle four with a low, additional low dose interleukin two, uh, one million units per day, which is not much, uh, only three days after the antibody treatment. So all patients with metastatic relapsed neuroblastoma can take part into the study or patients who are refractory to standard treatment. Up to now, four uh, centers um, take part into the study. And uh, this is the relapse treatment, of course. Before transplantation starts, you have to achieve another remission or at least a partial remission. And various chemotherapy cycles have been used to induce another remission. Topotecan VP16 or cyclophosphamide, which is, uh, which is a, a combination out of the German relapse protocol, or nowadays irinotecan timosolamide, uh, which is, I think, a very good thing to 
to induce another remission. If possible, we do a surgical intervention or irradiation prior to transplant to get rid of tumor masses, or to get rid of bulky tumor. And if at least a partial remission has been achieved, the patients can proceed to another MIBG, to the haplotransplantation itself, and to the following immunotherapy. This are the diagnosis. Um, uh, uh, this is the disease status at time of diagnosis. 33 patients had a first metastatic relapse and four patients had a second or higher metastatic relapse. The disease status will be evaluated by whole body MRI, by MIBG and by, by bone marrow aspirates. 37 patients received or receive at the moment the antibody. 29 patients have been enrolled in the official study, which is ongoing at the moment, and I also want to show eight pilot patients. 34 patients can be evaluated at the moment. A progression or dropout occurred in 14 out of these 34 patients. Two patients stopped, or the parents stopped, due to side effects. One patient uh, experienced transplant-related mortality, unfortunately, and 11 patients had a progression or relapse during the antibody infusions. Stable disease or improvement of the, um, of the clinical status occurred in 20 out of 34 patients, and we deem that as treatment success. Here you can see the evaluation after the end of the antibody treatment after six cycles. You can see these patients started in complete remission prior to antibody treatment and they could maintain their complete remission. These patients started with partial remission and achieved a complete remission during antibody treatment. These two patients had an improved partial remission and could improve the partial remission during uh, antibody treatment and one patient had a stable disease. Unfortunately, five patients progressed during, uh, no, not, did not progress during the antibody, but progressed after the antibody treatment, progressed or relapsed after the antibody treatment. Of course, we also have very well-known side effects. You all know anti-GD2 causes an inflammation with pain, and all of our patients needed uh, morphine infusions. With fever, most of the patients had fever during the antibody um, uh, infusions, and with CRP elevations. We also saw accommodation disturbances in seven out of 25 patients. Uh, we think that this is only a transient problem. And we were happy to see that we did not induce graft versus host disease, which was a, a, a major concern uh, of our study. But the antibody treatment and the inflammation do, did not induce graft versus host disease. Only We observed only one GVHD, which was transient in one patient. And we observe no additional side effects due to the interleukin-2 because we use in this approach a very, very low dose of IL-2. Of course, several severe adverse events occurred, mainly infections. However, these infections are typically for the post-transplant period. And we think this is not related to the antibody itself but to the time, to the early time after transplantation. We saw one lethal HHV6 infection, which does not occur after autologous transplantation, but in the case of haploidentical transplantation, we have a, a, a lack of T cell immunity for several days and weeks afterwards, but we have very well working NK cells. However, NK cells cannot prevent uh, all cannot prevent all viral infections. So we, ha we have seen 
adenovirus infection, HHV6 infection, uh, BK virus infections, but only one infection was indeed lethal. All other infections could be treated with antiviral medicaments. And this is, of, uh, this is indeed a typical um, problem in the post-transplant period. We also saw, however, we also saw um, side effects which are definitely related to the antibody like capillary leak, and you all know that hypotonia, seizures, Menin uh, sterile meningitis and uh, persisting vomiting. But we did not see um, unexpected side effects which were not seen or known by uh, antibody infusions in the autologous setting. So the overall survival is now 550 days, 24 patients are alive, 13 patients died unfortunately due to relapse or progression and due to infections, which is called in that approach transplant-related mortality. And this is the event-free survival at the moment. The three-year event-free survival is now 40%. Here you can see the influence of the remission status prior to treatment uh, as expected if patients already have a complete remission prior to haplotransplantation, uh, the prognosis is better than in patients who start with a partial remission. And an unexpected and interesting finding was that patients with NMIC positivity seem to have a better survival than patients Without NMIC amplification, of course, this is only a low number of patients and this is not statistically significant, but I, I would like to show you this interesting finding. One explanation made might be, one hypothesis might be, the different GD2 expression on various cell lines. Here you can see the NMIC positive cell line IMR32, which expresses a high number of GD2 molecules, and this is an NMIC negative uh, cell line, SKNB, which is, expresses only very low numbers of GD2 molecules. So one, one could speculate that such cell lines should be more susceptible to ADCC and NK cell lysis than those of cell lines which do not express a lot of GD2. And indeed, um, Kaneko et al. could show that a couple of NMIC positive uh, cell lines indeed expresses higher numbers of GD2 than NMIC negative cell lines. So this is just a hypothesis, of course. Here you can see the influence of time to first relapse. The red line depicts patients who had uh, a time to first relapse of six to 18 months, and the blue line depicts patients who had a longer time to first relapse. This seemed to be not significant or seems to have no clear influence. And the same was true for the age at diagnosis. The blue line depicts uh, younger patients. The red line depicts older patients. However, these are very small patient numbers and uh, these things are not significant at the moment. So our conclusions at the moment are a combination of haplotransplantation and use of the well-known CH1418 antibody is feasible. We saw a low risk of inducing graft versus host disease. However, we saw, of course, several side effects due to inflammation. On the other hand, we also saw a stimulation of the donor-derived immune system. We have seen that the endogenous IL-2 secretion increases, and we have seen a good NK cell activations. I, I did not show you the slides because of time reasons. And we saw a clinical response in about uh, 20 out of 34 patients with a three-year event free survival of 40% at the moment. So finally, I want to thank all my colleagues who contributed to this ongoing work and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>